Hello, this is Richard Rubin. This lecture was originally given on Friday, October 5th, 2018 at Webster University in St. Louis in conjunction with the opening of an exhibit of abstract photographs by my late wife, Rebecca Lynn Barnard. The exhibit runs through Friday, October 26th at the May Gallery on the Webster campus. The photo on this opening slide is not in the exhibit, though it does have some abstract features. It is one of Beck's unusual self-portraits and is made up of her legs and feet and their reflections in, in several mirrors. Before I begin the lecture, I want to thank several people. Peg Hilpert and Andre Laszlo helped frame the photos and had to contend with the seemingly endless task of getting rid of the dust between the glass and the mat. Shelley Helfman helped figure out what several of the photos were originally of. Nancy Rice helped analyze a few more. Nancy is also owed thanks for lending us the two small manipulated Polaroids that we have included in the show. Ten years ago, Nancy was chairman of the art department at, at Maryville University and helped arrange a retrospective exhibit of Beck's work. A few of the pictures in this exhibit were in that extensive show, but many have never been publicly shown before. Thanks also go to my current partner, Linda Eastman, for reviewing some of the material I've written, for helping to select pictures, and for her patience and understanding while I have spent considerable time with my previous partner's work. Finally, thanks go to the photography program at Webster University, and especially to its chairman, Bill Barrett, for recognizing that Beck's images might make up a May Gallery exhibit, for helping guide the selection and for the professional way that he and his student crew installed the framed images. Several philosophers have told us that to say anything meaningful about abstraction, you have to be as concrete as possible. I aim to do that, but I'll start by saying generally that for this lecture, what is meant by an abstract photograph is any image taken with a camera where what predominates is the interplay of the formal elements, line, color, shape, and shadow, or where these abstract qualities supplement or emphasize other relationships found in the image. Uh, Shelley Helfman, who is a painter, remarked that you have an object and you also have what your vision perceives about the object, and that the move toward abstraction is when the flavor of the perception becomes at least as important as the object itself. A few years ago, I showed Bill Barrett a wide range of Beck's photos covering a variety of topics. He said that he wanted the abstract ones. At the time, I thought that the pictures that were undeniably abstract in that it was perhaps impossible to figure out what the objects photographed were, formed a small quirky corner of Beck's oeuvre. For example, she took many pictures of botanical subjects. This is a service berry. Here are some lily pads with water drops. Beck loved taking pictures of reenactors because they loved having their pictures taken. One reenactor told her, you make us look better than we are. She replied, well, for one 125th of a second, that's exactly what you look like. The reenactor pictures show her sense of portraiture. Here's a picture of her stepmother, Sylvia Barnard, in an outdoor setting. And uh, here's a more formal portrait of her grandmother, Thelma Wright. The subjects Beck photographed most often were houses in neighborhoods. Here's one 
in Naples, Florida, where her mother lived. She loved finding the way people decorated their houses. And when it is somewhat goofy, as in this one, with the, with the beachscape sunset on the garage door, with the painted palm trees extending past and above the door, with the little bird and the, I mean, with the bird and the, the little girl figurine with a white hat and umbrella, it was something to celebrate. No, she wouldn't want to live, live there herself, but look, look at how they are trying to make their lives more beautiful. Sometimes the irony is in something accidental. The way the unreturned shopping cart is the bright spot in this image. Notice that these neighborhood pictures have no people in them. In this one, where the composition is as formal as a painting, a woman can barely be discerned, her presence almost hinted at amidst the subtle reflections in the window. Here are some newly shorn lambs on their mother's back. This is a black and white image that Beck printed in the color dark room. There was only one pure black and white image in this exhibit. Bill Barrett printed this one for me because I did not have a good print. It is from her post dark room period following the closing of the color dark room at Forest Park Community College. Beck had a little more than 10 years of making her own prints, mainly at Forest Park. She would arrive at the lab on Saturday morning, 10 minutes before it opened at 10 a.m. to be sure she could use her preferred enlarger in the back. Other than the enlarger, she brought her own equipment, including a negative carrier. The title of this picture does give you a clue as to what it is of, stems in water. If you haven't unpacked it already, the image shows stems protruding from beneath the water surface. Each stem is reflected in the water at the point where it emerges. In this exhibit, all the other monochromatic images are, are from the large number of black and white in color prints that Beck made at Forest Park. A large print of this photo and of this one are among the four Rebecca Barnard prints in the collection of Wells Fargo. There are three prints in the show that are larger than Beck's usual five by seven size. This one is from 1994 it was exhibited as untitled in a group show at the Skit Stein Gallery in Clayton in the mid 90s. This one is a bit harder to figure out immediately. I have given most of the pictures in this exhibit names that refer either to formal properties or very obvious features. This naming method is meant to promote looking at the images in the way Beck would have preferred. In museums, for example, she would never get headphones and always look at the object on display before reading the, the label. This photo is labeled circle, rising diagonals, dark background. By now, I, I'm sure you've probably determined what it's a picture of. Yes, it does have an alternative title, Automobile Grill. In the back of the handout for the exhibit, there is a supplementary section that gives some alternative titles and in some cases a determination or guess as to what the objects before the camera might have been. But Beck would have wanted you to look first. There is an even larger print of automobile grill. That larger picture of automobile grill is the same size as uh, this image, about two feet by three feet. Um, the larger automobile grill is not in the show, but this one is. It's right at the beginning of the exhibit, 
and this one is called Emma in Stroller. I did not give it a cryptic label because it is obvious that it's a stroller and it barely matters except to Beck's relatives that Emma is her niece because Emma's head is cut off and this is hardly the sort of memory picture you might give to your sister. But perhaps the most important thing about this picture is what Beck said when she saw it while we were preparing the Maryville exhibit 10 years ago. This was one of several large prints in the show. Four of them were on loan from Wells Fargo, then Wachovia. I tried to get one for this show, but Wells Fargo is in the midst of, is in the midst of some bureaucratic entanglement regarding the art it owns. So Beck looks at one of the large prints, perhaps this one, and says, that's not what I'm about. So, I'm very glad that we have a show made up mostly of five by seven prints to remind you that it is not necessary to blow images up very large to see their beauty. But as I did have one, a very large size already framed, I thought you might want to see that one too. All the images in this exhibit are of things as Beck found them in the world. Most of the time, Beck did not deliberately alter the environment, other than adding color to black and white images or changing the exposure of an image. She did not manipulate images in the dark room. There is no pasting parts of different images together, nor making unwanted elements disappear, as people people often do today in Photoshop. There is, however, one series, about 50 images of pairs, where Beck arranged the pairs in odd places in ways she thought visually interesting. I mention these pair pictures because next month there will be another exhibit of Rebecca Barnard's photos at the Kathy Gregory Gallery in the Shaw neighborhood. It opens November 3rd, this year, 2018, it will feature the pear series, the neighborhood photos, and the botanical series. No pictures from this exhibit will be in the next one. This pear picture suggests a move toward abstraction with the out-of-focus Angkor postcard. What I noticed as I began to select images for this show was that abstraction was not some odd side venture in Beck's work. In every one of her principal subject areas, there are images containing elements that bring out formal properties or that obscure parts of an image. Look at the background and foreground in this picture of bearded irises. It's perfectly clear what the picture is about, but the narrow focus makes parts of the image lack any clear reference. Beck was extremely myopic. She said, when I take off my glasses, I see things nobody else sees. When she got her first pair of glasses at the age of perhaps nine, she said, does everybody see this way? This oak, oak leaf hydrangea picture is about more than just a plant. It is not abstract. But there are ideas in play. You have a dark leaf protecting a lighter one. You have young leaves and mature ones. So it's about relationships, about growth, and about care. You also have the mystery without fear that draws us into the dark background from which the leaves emerge. About the same time Beck took the formal picture of her grandmother, she also took this less formal one. Her grandmother is at the side of the picture. Part of her head is cut off, something we've seen before and will see again. But the picture is clearly about her grandmother, reading the newspaper with a magnifying glass while her breakfast and milk awaits. Notice that the milk is in a glass labeled Coke. Again, not an abstract picture, but one that moves toward it because the way the objects are visually placed 
tells us something about their relationship. This photo from the Neighborhood series calls our attention to the squares and rectangles formed by the white screen door placed in front of the garage and which, by being there, calls attention to the squares and rectangles on the garage door itself, as well as the angles and junctures of the roof, um, geometric shapes that might not be noticed otherwise. The image also contains a bit of a mystery. The narrow horizontal wood piece that goes from the screen door to the side of the garage, that white uh, piece of wood. Uh, it, 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 it suggests that the screen door might be permanently fixed in front of the garage door, but closer examination reveals a moiré pattern below the horizontal piece. Can you see it? And uh, so that indicates that that um, that white piece of wood is the top of a square screen that, like the screen door, is resting against the garage. So the image is a way of regarding the ambiguity between the temporary and the permanent. And what is that reflected in the side of the vehicle? Oh, and we see only part of the vehicle, another instance of Beck cutting things off, giving us just what we need to know to get what she's driving at. Now, I'd like to take a brief 10-minute excursion into the recent history of abstraction in Western art to illustrate the difference between abstraction in photography and abstraction in painting. This examination is hardly irrelevant uh, to this exhibit. Beck loved outsider art. One of her favorite museums was the Museum of Folk Art in New York, and Beck would be appalled at what MoMA did to its 53rd Street location. But, but Beck was not an outsider herself in the sense of being naive. Her collection of art books, especially photography, was extensive. And she knew the images from that history very well. So here we are in England about 1825 with the George Arnold's picture, the Battle of the Nile, a battle which took place in 1798. The water, the ships, the people are painted in detail. Ten years later, Turner paints another river catastrophe, the burning of the houses of lords and commons, with a radical change in style. Instead of meticulously rendering the water, the boats, and the people, Turner suggests the water, the flames, and the smoke with splashes of color. The people are dots of color suggesting heads and faces with somewhat broader brushstrokes for the clothing. Here's Peace, Burial at Sea, seven years later in 1842. Only the sails of the ship have sharp edges. What happened in those seven years from 1835 to 1842? Something happened. The invention of photography was publicly announced. And here's another Turner from the same period, yacht approaching the coast. There are no sharp lines at all. At about the same time, another artist who was to influence later paintings was focusing on more bucolic settings. In this forest of Fontainebleau painting, Camille Corot does not paint the leaves of the tree or foreground with any precision, but lets the color of the paint and the shape of the clump suggest what they are. Nearly 20 years later, Corot, in Souvenir de Mort Fontaine, depicts falling leaves merely as drops of light color. That was in 1864. Eight years later, we get this. Impression Soleil Levant, Impression Sunrise, a Monet painting that gave the name to an entire movement. Soon after, Monet's friend Whistler, the American in London, gave us this, Nocturne in Black and Gold, The Falling Rocket.
Here's another Whistler Nocturne, blue and silver, Battersea Reach. Look at the color as we leap ahead to 1904. Yes, it's a photograph, one of Edward Steichen's prints of his flat iron building picture, layering pigment over a platinum print. The people and horse carriages are all in silhouettes. The figure with the umbrella is less clear than the sails of the yacht in Turner's painting. Now I'm skipping over all the other Impressionists, the Post-Impressionists, the Fauves, the various theories of color that proliferated in the 19th and early 20th century. Well, we do need to pause and look at Cezanne, who had begun to break an image down in, in, into its geometric fundamentals. The blue spot on the card is a square, not an obvious spade or club, and the background through the window is as vague as the background in Beck's bearded irises. The card players, this card player uh, painting was in 1898. Within a decade, and only a few years after the Steichen print, you had stuff like this. This is by Albert Glaze who regarded Cezanne as the father of Cubism because he freed painting from what he called the slavery to the retina, to which the Impressionists were in thrall. The Cubists took various views of objects and fused them together into a composition. But at the same time, this was going on. In fact, a year before this 1911 painting, we have this from Kandinsky. This untitled painting is known as the first abstract painting. There is no attempt to reproduce ordinary views of objects in the world. Kandinsky was interested in making the effects of color and form operate in the way music works without regard to external objects. This marks the break of painting from photography. Of course, artists have used photographic materials to generate purely abstract objects, as in this photogram by Maholi Naj. In this discussion, the focus on photographic abstraction is on what passes through the lens of the camera as a photographer captures what the world provides. Beck used to say, when I'm with my camera, it's as if the world were giving me all these gifts. Now, most of you are familiar with the many directions painting took following the Cubists and Kandinsky. Uh, for example, here in 1929, we have Mondrian with nothing but rectangles, lines, and primary colors. Or there are artists like Georgia O'Keeffe, who literally abstracts form from the ordinary visual world. When we think of abstraction in art today, we probably think of artists like Jackson Pollock, whose splashes of color and, li and line expressed visceral emotions and are at some remove from the spiritual, atemporal, music-like objects of Kandinsky. This painting is Convergence from 1952. Where are the objects here? We also think of uh, painters like Hans Hoffman, whose 1964 painting Song of the Nightingale is now on the screen. We think of the de Koonings, both Willem and Elaine, Helen Frankenthaler, Lee Krasner, Robert Motherwell, Franz Klein. I, I'm skipping over a great deal, but the point is that when we think of abstraction in painting, we don't think of any tie to external objects. Many photographers were influenced by these directions in painting, but the restriction of the being held to what the lens of a camera focused on photographic material channeled their creative direction.
the lens and the photographic material do offer opportunities to deviate from what our brains make out of what comes into the eye. Depending on what lens and what material you use, there are opportunities for altering the final product. Beck heated this Polaroid after it came out of the camera and used a small hard object, probably a coin, to make the image more abstract. Photographic lenses are not the same as the lenses of the eye. In this picture of a corridor and stairway, Beck used a fisheye lens to highlight this deviation. This image is the only fisheye photo I have found that Beck printed. So using this sort of distortion may have been a brief experiment on her part. I suspect, though, she liked that the picture could have been black and white, except for the, the red stairway, which she gives just enough of to know that it is, it is there. In fact, it is the curvature of the lens that makes it possible for that ma makes it possible for the bottom of the stairway to enter the frame at all. Let's get back to uh, what was happening in, uh, in, in photography as painters were exploring their various avenues of abstraction. There were a number of artists who worked in a variety of media, including photography. Mon Ray, for example, plays with the ambiguity of visual perception by photographing a woman's neck to look like something circumcised. Aaron Siskind was friends with several of the abstract expressionists, uh, including uh, Franz Klein, especially, William de Kooning, Robert Motherwell. He sought to close in on objects in order to reveal patterns that had some intrinsic appeal. Here's a striking pattern that comes from nothing more than peeling paint. Beck has an image in the exhibit that demonstrates a very similar focus. Another photographer known for his abstract work is Minor White. In this photo, Frostwave, the arch of the opening suggests it might be man-made, but the effects of the ice are all natural. This image may have some similarity of subject to Beck's photograph, scraped ice. But here, the effect is a human one on something man-made. It may be that this ice is on a car windshield and that we are looking through the interior and past the side windows. There are multiple planes of lines and light, streak, and light streaks. The only object that may be discernible aside from the glass surface is a tall window in the distance in the upper right. Beck's influences included not just the primarily abstract photographers like Siskin and White, but many others from Eugene Atche and Henri Cartier-Bresson to photographers working in America like Lee Friedlander, Robert Frank, and William Eggleston. Remember that glowing shopping cart? or the cut-off automobile. Here's Ralph Eugene Meat Yard, another. And here's one by Beck taken in Santa Fe. Ralph uh, Gibson was a photographer with whom Beck had a special resonance. It was only a few weeks ago that Andre Laszlo told me he had had a conversation with Beck where she told him how much she liked Gibson's work. In our house, there are well more than 25 feet of shelving containing photography and art books. Andre was able to tell me exactly where to find the Histoire de France, the book by Gibson that Beck had showed him. Look at, look at this picture. The most prominent object, the vase, is out of focus, while the nondescript background becomes as important as the blurred object. Similarly, in Beck's photo, the most colorful object, the McCarthy construction symbol, is blurred 
while the railing in the foreground, the beautifully articulated railing, is sharp. Here the issue is not so much the relevant importance of the objects, of the objects, but the contrast between something that has been completed and something not yet done, which the blurring of the construction symbol emphasizes. Shelley Helpman suggested the, the title of this image, Unfinished and Finished. You won't find any photograph by Beck that has all the elements of any one of Gibson's pictures. She was not an imitator in the sense of being a copier. But in this image by Gibson, you can see many of the features that occur in Beck's photos. The oddness of the angle, the yellow line popping out of an otherwise monochromatic image, cutting off part of an object, in this case, a person, and the tension between two and three dimensionality, in this case, arising from the perspective implied by the yellow uh, traffic line, which suggests a three-dimensional uh, setting because it leads into the street, and the triangle the yellow line forms to the left of the black post with the post and the curve, and also there's a trapezoid uh, on the right side of the post. These are geometric patterns that the man in the image was unaware of. So in Beck's photos, we have odd angles, a yellow line, and red semicircles in an otherwise monochromatic image. Remember the red staircase in the fish-eyed black and white corridor? Here we have part of an object cut off, in this case, uh, the, uh, a person's head. A question you might ask is, does showing only part of the human figure dehumanize it? Does it make it simply part of the pattern? Or, on the other hand, is what we have here a strikingly human moment? A man walks along a misty path, he carries a flashlight, perhaps to be seen in the dark and fog, but he does not need it at the moment, so he holds it casually behind him. The last element I mentioned was the ambiguity of or tension between dimensions. This picture does have that tension, but its kinship is not so much with Gibson's pictures as with some of the still lifes of Juan Gris in the colors, the curves, and the flattening of the perspective. Nevertheless, unlike the Juan Grease painting, this image is clearly a photographic one. It does present an interesting pattern of colors and shapes, but determining what was there when Beck took the photograph helps put this pattern in context. I owe Shelley Helpman a great debt for having figured most of it out. It should be fairly obvious that the curved glass shape to the right of center is a vase, that um, the wooden sticks in it are organic and therefore stems, can be seen in the way the notches are distributed. The tall curved shape just to the left of center is a projection of the vase made by light coming through the vase from the right. The vase sits on the sill of a window. It might appear that the white board in between the vase and its projection is facing us directly, but actually it is at an, an angle. It is the jam of the window. The window is set several inches away from the wall of the room. At the bottom of this white window jam is a paintbrush. The curvature of the, of the vase and perhaps the water in it make the white board of the jam appear to curve upward to the right of the black window frame when in fact the jam abuts the left side of the black frame in a straight line, a relationship we can see only in the upper portion of the image. The wooden panel on the left appears to be in the same plane as the white window jam, but that's because the projection of the vase extends to the full, to the full height of the image 
and obscures where the wood panel and whiteboard might come together. In fact, they don't come together. The wood panel is the side of what is probably a bookcase. Going toward the window, it ends at the wall, a wall whose presence can only be inferred, about an inch or two to the left of where the white jam coming from the window also ends at the wall. In looking at the Gibson picture, I noted that the man waiting by the curb did not notice the triangle formed by the curb, the yellow line, and the post. Beck titled one of her exhibits, What We Have Forgotten. When I organized her retrospective at Maryville University 10 years ago, I called it What We Have Forgotten Part Two. A more encompassing, or perhaps a supplementary title for all of Beck's work is what we have not noticed. Uh, this image uh, on the screen is on the poster that Bill Barrett made for the exhibit. On the poster, it is reversed, but either way, it looks purely abstract. Uh, but on the wall, it's hung this way. Perhaps you can see what it is. Yes, it's the side of an old automobile. This image has some sympathy with this one by Ralph Gibson. I'd like to say something about the selection process we used to eliminate some photographs we might have considered for the exhibit. Bill, after worrying we might not have not have enough pictures, saw that we had perhaps too many. He suggested we eliminate the ones in which the abstract element is primarily someone else's. That is where it, it is a picture of an abstract design rather than a picture where the abstraction is discovered by the photographer. So this picture of a Chinese screen was not included. This picture of a red stairway was not even considered as it lacks pronounced abstract elements. Whereas in this one, which is of the exact same location, the geometric interrelationships become prominent and the oddity of the red exterior and the green leaves inside the door become pronounced. It may not even be clear at first where those leaves are. Are they reflected from somewhere outside uh, until you notice the pot at the bottom of the plant indicating that the plant is just inside the door. Here is a version of a picture that was in the Christmas show uh, last December at the Kathy Gregory Gallery. But, the ver but it's not the version we used. I'm showing it to you to illustrate something about Beck's darkroom thinking. I'll, I'll quote Shelley Helpman. He once told me that the difference between painting and photography is that in painting, you have to decide what to include, where, whereas in photography, you have to decide what to leave out. This image was scanned from just one of many prints that Beck made from the same negative. Here's another. By making the print darker, Beck eliminated what she found to be extraneous elements. When I showed this to Shelley, he said, oh, I, I meant leaving out of the frame. Oh, well, Beck took his idea one step further. Here's another example of Beck's relishing the quirky decorations people employ. But she shot the little figurines indirectly in shadow, as if they were dancing behind the crisscross gate. I don't think that Beck's inclination toward abstraction was a matter of turning inward, as with some of the abstract expressionists, or moving away from the world toward a perceptible spirit, spiritual realm, as in Kandinsky. Rather, her focus was on finding the beauty the world offers, encouraging efforts to make beauty that are done with energy and commitment, even if clumsy or funny, and on training her eye to notice things. All of Rebecca Barnard's pictures con convey the delight she took in looking and in framing what she saw. I've mentioned the play of line, 
color, shape, and shadow, and the odd juxtapositions of things. Throughout her work, there is a great playfulness, a grateful reception of the gifts the world gave her, a joy in living. If you take into account her many photographs that show an appreciation for ordinary human life, an urge to discover the moment when it becomes extraordinary, you can see the abstract photographs were not meant to escape from the world, but to appreciate what is in it. If the selections in this exhibit can help you see what she saw and take the light in it, and if it can help you find more gifts in your own visual world to notice what you might not have noticed, then her time with her camera and in the dark room will not have been in vain.